everybody. In this episode, we're going to talk about new haircuts and what they can do for your crew. That's right. We're talking about Enterprise, episode one of season three. We finally made it to season three, which means we're talking about the Zindi. This episode dropped on September 10th, 2003. And now you're asking, why is any of that important? Well, here on Trek in Time, we're talking about all of Star Trek in chronological order, which means we're talking about the first stories of the Star Trek universe, which is Star Trek Enterprise. Well, fun fact, this is the season where they introduced the term, the, the phrase Star Trek to the title of the show. Up to this point, it's just yep. been Enterprise. Now it's Star Trek Enterprise. That explains everybody's confusion. <laughs> Does it? No. <laughs> so we're looking at all of Star Trek in chronological order, but we're also taking a look at what the world was like when these episodes originally aired. So we're looking at the latter days of 2003 at this point. And as I mentioned, it's an episode that aired on September 10th, 2003, which when we get into the news of the day, I think is going to create an interesting juxtaposition with what was going on in the episode. As usual, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matt. He's the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. So we have the writing, we have the teching, we have the star trekking. How you doing, Matt? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing okay. As usual, we like to jump to the comments at the beginning of the episode. Don't forget, you can send us information about yourselves and your thoughts on the show through the contact information in the podcast description or on YouTube. You can just scroll beneath image of our smiling faces and you can leave a comment there matt do you want to share some comments from previous episodes sure there's a couple i wanted to bring up from the expanse which was the season two finale uh we have one from longtime listener and supporter robotrav i agree with you guys about the klingon plot line being completely unnecessary and distraction from the main story i also didn't care for the way the vulcans were portrayed the scene with the vulcan doctor trying to surreptitiously psychoanalyze archer was ridiculous but yeah. flocks of course was still great it was just very out of character for the species the very idea of vulcan psychiatrist seems just off yeah i agree 100 percent. we didn't yeah. talk about that scene and yes that scene felt really kind of dissonant to me it didn't quite jive yeah and it played fast and loose with something that they had constantly been talking about which is vulcans don't lie and then yes. they have this guy show up and he is lying every direction and it just sets up this whole like to paul has been wrestling deeply with the idea of vulcan culture like her yes. you know really self-examining and then to throw in a character like that that seems to be so casually and cavalierly twisting facts yep it yep. it makes you wonder like well is to paul the outlier here is she the one who doesn't doesn't quite get it are all the other Vulcans perfectly comfortable with doing whatever? Yeah, it just didn't, it didn't feel like it was made of the same cloth. And, and like Robo points out, I do think that the only defense of that scene is that you get to see Phlox be the defender of the, of the yeah. crew. The, the other comment is along another Vulcan line here, which this is something else we've never really talked about, but it is always been in the back of my head whenever these, these scenes happen. I feel it's from Lambert Rodney. I feel T'Pol's continuing resistance to accepting time travel as a possibility when faced with mounting evidence is truly frustrating and unrealistic. At the very least, if the show is going to continue with T'Pol's incredulity, I can, can't speak, yeah. the audience should witness her wrestling with the notion of time travel instead of just simply flatly denying the possibility without a logical argument. Yeah. It does irritate me because it's like she's been through all of this with Archer and the rest of the crew again and again and again. You would think at this point she's still wrestling with it. Yeah. But the fact that she's still taking the party line of the Vulcans have proven that time travel cannot happen. It's like, come on. At this point, she should at least be saying, OK, there's a lot of holes in our theory and our knowledge here. Maybe maybe there is something here. Yeah. And it's frustrating. To go further, it's as uh, Lambert is pointing out here, she doesn't have a logical argument. No. The entire point of the depiction of Vulcans is that they follow logic to the final conclusion mm -hmm. and that the Vulcans are usually the ones in the room. You think about Spock's relationship to Kirk and McCoy, 
Kirk and McCoy will be standing on one side of the room saying that can't possibly be true. And Spock's like mm-hmm. logic dictates that this is the only possibility here. We're left with no other options. It does not make any sense that you would have a Vulcan in her position arguing against things she has literally seen from a yep. position of dogma. It just doesn't make yep. any sense. So good element to point out, Lambert. Thank you for the comment. So as I was going to say, oh, sorry, we're being interrupted by, that sounds like a read alert. That's right, Matt. It's time. And a little fun fact. What you are about to read is actually an abbreviated version. I lopped off the part, which is this series is an American television series because the way it was laid out on the page, it would have been so much reading. You would have needed a separate podcast. So I boiled it down to this. So enjoy. Okay. Set in the 22nd century, the series follows the adventures of the first Starfleet Starship Enterprise registration NX-01. Beginning with this episode, Season 3 of Enterprise features an ongoing storyline following an attack on Earth by previously unknown aliens called the Zindi at the end of Season 2. In this episode, the crew of the Enterprise attempt to track down the location of the Zindi homeworld by asking a lone Zindi enslaved in a mining colony. After being tricked by the mining foreman, Captain Jonathan Archer, Scott Bakula, and Commander Charles Trip Tucker III, Connor Trenier, escape with the Zindi. With assistance from Lieutenant Malcolm Reed, Dominic Keating, and the show's new military assault command operations, Mako team. Okay. (laughs) And that's pretty much it. And there we have it. Zindi. Wow. Season three, episode one, directed by Alan Croker, written by Rick Berman, Brandon Braga, and originally aired on September 10th, 2003. Guest appearances include Richard Lineback, Stephen McCaddy, Tucker Smallwood, Randy Oglesby, Rick Worthy, Scott McDonald, Marco Sanchez, a very early appearance by Daniel Day Kim, which Mm. I was interested to see him in this, knowing that his days ahead of him, he would, well, for a little while, he'd be on a little show called Lost. And then beyond that, he's been growing as a producer. So he is Mm. an extremely prolific and talented Hollywood power man. Also in this episode were Nathan Anderson, Stephen Culp, Chris Freeman, and Adam Taylor Gordon. It is a large list of extras for this episode. We see a lot Mm -hmm. of faces, some of whom we will see again in other episodes. There's also a bit more heavy lifting with set design, some impressive sets, some impressive locations that go beyond the norm, a new room aboard the Enterprise, which is supposed to be a battle command center. There is the inclusion now of the Mako team, which, as is pointed out, is supposed to be a full-blown military operation. I think they're trying to depict at this point that Starfleet is not considered military. There's some questions around the efficacy of, like, what is the role of this? I mean, it looks like it's supposed to be five guys. They're really sending out five guys to exact revenge for having blown up all of Florida and parts of Venezuela. I don't, like... There's a little bit of illogic in their inclusion there, unless it was also, if there had been some sort of reference to, and they've brought along a super weapon, like anything other than like, oh, these five guys are going to take care of everything. That's great. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, As I mentioned, this air date was originally September 10th, 2003. So here we are at almost the second anniversary of the September 11th attacks in the United States. And... I think this show, it's very interesting. It's almost too on the nose with the lingering repercussions of this kind of terror attack. They are on their way to exact revenge. Meanwhile, the United States at this point had largely wrapped up military operations in Iraq after invading post-invasion of Afghanistan. The United States was in the midst of two wars, both of which were arguably about setting things right Mm -hmm. while not quite knowing how to get to right. And this episode starts to tease out some of those very questions of, well, how do we do the right thing? And is it okay to do the right thing in the wrong way? And I thought it was interesting that we're only two years past September 11th and it's already that mentality is already leaking into popular culture. The kind of questioning of how quickly are we jumping to this thing? So we'll get into that more in a moment. 
But what else was going on in the world? Well, Matt, get ready. You're going to be singing along to Where is the Love by the Black Eyed Peas for quite a few weeks. Oh, jeez. And at movie theaters? No. Well, what were we lining up for? <laughs> you will never guess. I am actually scratching my head over the fact that the number one movie, the week that this episode aired, made $6 million in the box office. Matt, is it me? Or was there a day that Labor Day weekend was basically a non-release weekend? Now That sounds way too low. We basically have constant new releases practically every month of the year. It no longer seems like there is the dead zone. It used to be February was where studios dumped all the movies that they didn't know what else to do with, and it was the dead zone for, for the block for the box office for a movie to be the number one movie to make $6 million total just seems to me like this must have been Labor Day weekend. And I'm trying to recall, was there a day when movie makers simply wouldn't release new movies around Labor Day? Now that doesn't seem yes. to make sense, but is that the way it historically worked? Yes, that's that, that's, that was the way it used to be. But at the same time, $6 million seems way too low, even for that kind of like dip of yeah. the season. Yeah. Which makes and the it, fact what movie it is, yeah. oh my God, I don't remember this movie at all. <laughs> yes, here we, here we go, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we're going deep into a parallel reality where the number one movie of the week was <laughs> Dickie Roberts, <laughs> former child star. It's a 2003 American comedy directed by Sam Weissman, starring David Spade, who co-wrote the film with Fred Wolf. It includes Mary McCormick, John Lovitz, Craig Bierko, Alyssa Milano and Rob Reiner. Spade portrays a child actor who fell into obscurity as an adult and who attempts to revive his career by getting a part in Rob Reiner's next film. In addition, the movie shows Dickie interacting with numerous former child stars played by over two dozen actual former stars lampooning their careers, such as Leif Garrett, Barry Williams, Corey Feldman, Emmanuel Lewis, Dustin Diamond, and Danny Bonanducci. It is remarkable how many of those people are now dead. I had zero recollection of this movie i nope. read this description and read about the movie several times i still have no recollection of it i don't think it exists we're moving on <laughs> okay <laughs> and what was on television that's what you're all wondering what was going on television well not good news for enterprise why would that be you you're asking and rightfully so september 10th 2003 enterprise on UPN was enjoyed by 4.1 million viewers. Definitely not the low point for viewership for the series. But when you consider it's that better. it's actually up. it's up from the end of season two, but it's not great when you consider that 8 million people were watching a rerun of my wife and kids, 5 million mm -hmm. people were watching a repeat of the seventies show. 5 million people were watching a rerun of Ed and Smallville, which was also a rerun on WB was getting almost 3 million viewers. So Enterprise with a brand new episode, the only new episode of the evening, only getting 4 million. I think we're seeing a show that had a core audience that was its only audience and the show was having difficulty reaching beyond those borders. And in the news, well, here's the news story that stood out to me from the New York Times. And I think it feeds into the same thing I was talking about earlier about the U.S., the culture was starting to wrestle with, wait, what are we doing? What is our goal? And is what we're doing the best way to get to that goal post 9-11? From the New York Times by Mike McIntyre, two years later, the Patriot Act, terror lesson fading for some, Ashcroft says in Manhattan. Standing on the site where Congress adopted the Bill of Rights, Attorney General John Ashcroft brought his defense of the Patriot Act to the edge of ground zero yesterday and suggested that critics of the act, a sweeping anti-terrorism law, quote, have forgotten how we felt on September 11th, 2001. I think this is a critically important thing to keep in mind that effectively what John Ashcroft was defending was holding on to the fear, that anger. the terror, yeah. the anger of September 11th. Don't process it. Don't move on. Don't try to Take a step back, figure out what happened and why. Don't look for causes. Just hold on to the anger and the fear. To defend the Patriot Act in those terms, I think, is accidentally revealing your hand. Oh, yeah. 
And Big time. where we were, the other headlines from the day revolved largely around ongoing terror attacks in the Middle East. Israel had just experienced a terror attack in a deli that was targeted because it was a place where soldiers were known to get lunch. And it was one of the deadliest terror attacks in years in Jerusalem. Seven Israeli soldiers died in that attack. So the war on terror was not being won. Afghanistan, Iraq had both been invaded. Active military operations were winding down in both places or over, and yet both those places were in the midst of some kind of rebuilding that we know, looking back, Mm -hmm. long-term, would not hold. So what was the goal? How were we getting there? These were things that were beginning to be reported on and talked about in popular culture, and they had already, in just two years, already leaked into storytelling like what we're seeing in this episode of Enterprise. When this episode starts, we see that the crew has been on the hunt for the Zindi for six weeks. They've made it through the expanse, and they are now in unknown territory. And you get right off the bat the sense that they are just wandering around in the dark. They're all angry. Everybody's very very frustrated and angry. There's a lot of anger. You have the chewing out scene, which I think was right out of the uh, starting gate, you end up with Archer having a moment with his main security officer, Reed, and he, he rips him apart for having suggested that they might not be using their time well. Not the kind of action that we would expect from Archer during the first two seasons. This is, not, this is an Archer who is carrying a pretty big chip on his shoulder. Well, also pressure, because they are the only ship trying to defend not just just humans in general, but the entire planet Earth. So it's like he clearly, the pressure is getting to him, the fact that he cannot, they're not making any progress. Yeah. So his, for me, it made sense why he's lashing out. It didn't feel out of character at all. It, it fit pretty well. Yeah, this episode felt to me like if you didn't know any of the previous storytelling, if you were jumping mm-hmm. in completely just based on the synopsis at the beginning of the episode, it would not have taken long to get a sense of what the show is doing. And mm-hmm. it, there were points in the first two seasons where I think you could have dipped in and out of the show and it wouldn't have mattered. But this feels very much like the beginning of some other kind of storytelling where the tone of this reeks of we're not going to resolve this issue by the end of the episode and oh yeah this feels like a long-term play and my question to you matt is does that did that resonate with you this time around did it resonate with you when you first watched the series and does it resonate with you now yes uh i we kind of hinted at this (laughs) as we were going through the end of season two of like just hang in there we're getting to season three hang in there we're getting to season three Part of the reason I felt that way was my memory of how I felt the first time I watched it, as well as how I'm feeling this time watching it. The show actually feels like it has a purpose Mm -hmm. now, where it didn't before. It feels like it has something to say, which it really didn't before. And it's doing something interesting that we haven't seen in Star Trek before, which is exciting. So it's, it's, to me, ticking all the boxes of what I was hoping for, just like, please find your footing, find it, something you can get behind. It's kind of like when uh, Next Generation brought the Borg in. It was like, to me, that's when Next Generation felt like it found its stride. Right. And it like started hitting things at all, on all cylinders. And like when Jean-Luc got turned into a Borg and then rescued and all that kind of stuff, it's like, that's when Next Generation was like, okay, now we're like at fighting weight and we're, we know what we're doing. This is what this show feels like to me. It feels like, okay, the Zindi and the Expanse, this whole thing, they've turned a corner yeah so it's like i'm i'm i was on board from the first like 10 minutes like i said it's like you could see the frustration if i came into this show never having seen an episode before i could step into this yeah and very quickly grasp what's at stake what's going on why is he so angry oh my god they're trying to protect the entire planet earth it's like okay that's why he's stressed out beyond belief and so it's like it's very easy to step into this season and it, it felt very it felt like they crafted it that way deliberately because it's, it seemed like they were taking this as a 
okay, let's wipe the slate clean. Let's kind of start the show over. Let's add Star Trek at the beginning of the title. Let's give this a, a starting point where people who kind of gave up on the show can come back in and kind of get it to it from the very beginning. And let's see if we can pull people together and get them stuck for an entire season Yeah. instead of going in and out episode to episode. So it felt like it was designed to try to get people to come in and then stay week to week to week to week. Yeah. So hopefully they're going to try to stick to that, that 4.1 million people they got this one. It's like, it's clear to me that they're trying to hang on to that 4.1 and not lose anybody. Yeah. And what's interesting is if you scratch the paint, you can see it's the same metal. The nuts and bolts of the writing at this point, I think are pretty clear. Time travel is still a part of this storyline because Mm -hmm. as we move through this episode, we jump to the end. We'll talk about things kind of in and out of order uh, a bit. They reveal that there is, when they get to the location that they believe is the Zindi homeworld, they find that it was destroyed decades earlier. So the question becomes, if the Zindi are trying to destroy Earth before Earth can destroy the Zindi homeworld, but the homeworld is already gone. What is happening here? What is the what is the order of events? How can this possibly be true? So time travel is no different than the entire series setup of the idea of the temporal Cold War that's going on. The biggest difference is the temporal Cold War literally was introduced with a story that revolved around the Klingons. Mm-hmm. So the first go at this series was, well, let's introduce this crazy new element, the temporal Cold War, but let's do it with all the known players of Star Trek. This time around, they're like, okay, that's not working. Everybody's too beholden to what we know the future of all these different species will be. So we can't be mm-hmm. like, oh, the Klingons are now going to grow tails and be leopards. You know, it's, we can't do anything to these people because we know what Klingons are like in the future. So they finally recognized, oh, maybe the problem is too much known space. So literally just taking the ship into, you know, through a cloak called the Expanse, where once they're on the other side of it, there's really no communicating back. They are on their own puts this series in footing similar to what Voyager had while mixing it with the temporal issues that they've tried to introduce, the idea of we don't know the order of what these things are going to be like. And then you get to that newness, and one of the newness elements that I feel like was here is they've added a few drips of Star Wars into the mix. This feels very Star Wars to me, especially prequel Star Wars where you see the nefarious group of villains, which at a certain point when Phlox is looking at the DNA of the Zindi that they've come in contact mm-hmm. with, and his entire interpretation of this is nothing is really making sense because that's a Zindi and he's got skin like a human. But the DNA I have here is reptilian. So how can this possibly be? And when we see what appears to be some sort of conference of Zindi supervillains, we see multiple species. Well, the Zindi in the prison camp that we meet says we don't have a dominant species. We have five different species that all kind of vie for dominance. And depending on who you talk to, each of them claims to be the dominant species. This is the equivalent of here on Earth, if we had the UN and the UN was made up of humans, bees, dolphins, like every conceivable mix is is represented and that to me feels very star wars the insectoid clicking talk the whale song coming from the giant tank of the very clearly aquatic creatures the humanoids and the lizard people you know talking to each other in spoken language but the other parts of it feeling intentionally off-putting All of that, to me, Mm -hmm. had a sort of Star Wars feel to it. And the other place where it felt like Star Wars was when they end up at the planet where they know there's a Zindi on a crew without knowing that what they're actually stumbling into is a slave operation and end up in a situation where the various players, like the manager of this mining operation, walking around with his breathing mask that he has to pull in front of his face every once in a while in order to keep himself alive. And he's struggling for breath most of the time. 
that all felt very Star Wars to me. If mm -hmm. it stepped into being Star Trek when the rescue operation came, when you had the very military operation, the sort of decorum of the military operation of the Starfleet personnel showing up to rescue their, their other crewmen, that felt like Star Trek. But the elements that were a little more, well, we have to shoot from the hip, we're kind of like piecing together an escape route. They go through a whole underground sewage plasma vent escape route, all of which, which felt very new for Trek. It was in environments that seemed very well thought out and a lot of money clear, clearly going into set work and set design that we really haven't seen in Enterprise in particular up to this point. And it had a kind of shoot from the hip feel that I don't think we've necessarily seen in the even the original series. It 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 had a yeah. different tone to it. And I wondered if you picked up on that as well. I didn't pick it up like you said, it felt very Star Wars to you. It did not feel Star Wars to me at all. But I see what you're getting at. The vibe was very different mm -hmm. than what we've seen, but for me, it didn't feel that. I think the reason I didn't feel that shift was because everything that's happening on the Enterprise felt very normal. It felt very mm -hmm. what we're used to, and it felt very personal. And the seeds that were dripping for the th threads of the different storylines with T'Pol, with Trip, with the Captain, with Reed and his new nemesis, the head of the Makos. It's like all that kind of stuff. It was laying down the very kind of personal interactions that we expect out of Star Trek shows mm -hmm. and how they're going to unfold and change and evolve over time and challenge each other. And that aspect felt very Star Trek to me. But the vibe with the introduction of this, the Zindi, it, once again, it's like we've seen alien <laughs> aliens on Star Trek before, mm -hmm. but this is the first time we've seen them as, oh, this is one species yeah. together in their little you know, Doom Patrol little setup they had where they're having their <laughs> nefarious meetings yeah. and machinations. It really kind of, you're getting at, yeah, but it kind of set up a yeah. almost an anti federation at that moment yeah. for me. It felt like yeah. an anti federation, and the depiction of how the the heroes were going in not with swagger but with grim determination, I think, was also a departure from the series where. You know, we've seen the operations you mentioned, uh, Picard's experience with the Borg. Even in that, Riker, Riker's response to that entire operation and how to conduct a battle against the Borg, which would allow him to rescue his captain and still be able to defeat the Borg in that moment, mm -hmm. felt like it was operating within decorum that we had come to expect. And in fact, that's part of what is at play. There's that moment in that episode of Next Generation when he's conducting the operations where in the battle it's reported that the Borg are ignoring the saucer section. And Riker's response to that is, as you should, Captain, because he knows Picard doesn't see the saucer section as the primary target in that. He's using that against his captain. That's all very yep. Star Trek-y thinking. Whereas this, when they wander into the mining colony, it feels very different. And the way that they even have to negotiate a price of liquid platinum, the, all of the negotiations around money and value feels outside the norm for Star Trek. Well, I would say, for me, the reason it doesn't is that this is Enterprise. The Federation doesn't exist yet. Right. And like they still don't even have a prime directive. They're flirting with it. They don't have it yet. So it's like, for me, it still felt very Star trek -y because it's like we're seeing the formation of the foundations of why they have these different principles and how they operate that we're used to. So to see them struggling with different aspects of this makes sense. So here we are. I don't we disagree. Have them kind of yeah, going in there with I don't it. disagree with any of that. But we have them with this, but we have this 9-11 mentality of them just grim determination. And so like you brought up the exact example of them in the mining colony kind of going in there in a way we've never typically seen before which changes the vibe. Yeah. But at the same time, the finger gets handed to Archer and his disgust at like, why did you do this? Was very Federation Star Trek of yeah. like, 
this isn't appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this, you know what I mean? It's like they're yeah. going in there like, we're going to do it no matter what it takes. And why did you hand me a guy's finger? Yeah. This is completely inappropriate. So it's like, it still felt very Star Trek. That's part of the reason why it didn't feel like the vibe had completely shifted for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it still felt on the rails, <laughs> the Star Trek, like, yeah choo-choo train it didn't feel like it jumped off the rails at all with this vibe change it still felt like it was on course yeah for what we're used to i don't disagree with any of that when i'm within those boundaries yeah what i think i'm trying to uh convey is that in comparison to itself this feels very different from season okay two. yeah, yeah. The, yes. this oh my god this is a yeah it's a it's shift, a reset huge it's shift. a reset to a degree that is really quite surprising in you know within itself it would have been like if in season three of voyager they got back to earth it, well let me it's, i didn't look into this before we start i didn't look into this before we started talking but like we've always bagged on berman and braga mm-hmm. for feeling like they're burned out yeah and they've been going to the old playbook it's not working but they keep going to the playbook and it's still not working and this one i don't know how much influence they had or how much they were forced to make this shift or did it just take them a couple of seasons to realize we can't do this the way we've been doing it we have to come up with something new because this ain't working i'm Um, curious about i don't know how much yeah yeah i they were involved in writing this episode so i'm 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 very curious as to as you're just saying like was there something going on that was going to did network executives say, look, your numbers are not good enough to continue. Like this is, this isn't working. Were they in some way pushed into doing this? Were they scared straight? It's yeah, like they were yeah. kind of resting on their laurels and then they may have a, the show's going to get canceled unless you change things. Yeah. And they were kind of like, oh crap. So they kind of went back. They're very, t- they're very talented guys. Yeah. And so it, it feels like, oh, this is the Berman and Braga that we know. It's like, okay, they're kind of yeah. reinventing themselves. Yeah. What's interesting is that there's th- the reception of this episode overall wasn't super strong. There were some reviews no. at the time which said uh, IGN in particular gave it a one out of five and compared the Macos, the Marines, to Starship Troopers and the aliens, yep. the Zindi, were compared to Farscape. Which I think is an unfair comparison because I think Farscape is a really good show. So I'm like, I'll yeah. defend, I'll defend Farscape. To me, the the thing that this show is doing, I find it similar to Stargate Universe. In yeah, you know, and Stargate Universe was doing something that the most easily read, readily available comparison would be to Voyager and the idea of like we're super far away and we trying to get home. But I actually feel like this reset feels more like what was happening on stargate universe which if our listeners or viewers haven't seen that series took the stargate model and instead of the stargate being on a planet it was on a spaceship and they find themselves aboard this spaceship which is incredibly ancient they don't know who built it they don't know how it works exactly but they're just trying to get home um this felt like that to me of taking taking this crew into a place where okay we're not going to be able to rely on oh let's go do this fill in the blank from known star trek lore like it the first two seasons really feel like a chore because everything that they were trying to do 90 percent of the time was stuff we knew what 200 years in the future would be like and here we are in a position of they're going up against a species that we've never heard of before they're going up against a species that apparently attacked out of a fear of being destroyed. So in our Star Trek knowledge, you could make the logical argument, well, maybe the reason why we don't know about them is because humanity does destroy them. So you end up with actual stakes. And as Matt pointed out, the idea that they start this with, we're going to do whatever it takes. But the moment they're handed a finger, they kind of reel back and mm-hmm. you end up with some elements in this episode that stood out as clearly trying to plant seeds for the future. You have Tripp's dream in which he is, he is the one who is being depicted as living the pain of the attack on a daily basis. Yep. Archer feels the 
burden of the mission. Trip is the one who is holding on to and having difficulty processing the loss of his sister. And it's manifesting itself in these nightmares and the inability to sleep and is affecting his overall health to the point where Phlox, in an attempt to help alleviate this, because apparently the medicine of the future doesn't help you sleep, tries to connect Trip with T'Pol for some Vulcan acupuncture or acupressure techniques to help Trip sleep, which then leads to, you know, Season I three, to talk about this. season okay. three has let so, go of a lot of stuff that was unnecessary stuff from the first two seasons in very good ways, but apparently it held on to one thing, which was okay. Okay, how can we work hold some on, sex into the on. show? I, I want. I do want to talk about that, but I also want to say I like what they were doing with Trip and to Paul in this entire storyline. It it didn't feel out of place. It, mm-hmm. I thought it was good. I liked. Tri- I like T'Pol's reluctance to help him because she knows Trip yeah. is belligerent and will just not want to do this. But she w- is willing to give it a shot because she clearly cares for the crew and does want to help if she yes. can, but doesn't see- think he's going to take it. I did like th- how they were setting this all up. They do have to titillate for some bizarre reason. And so to have a scene with her with her shirt off, holding her breasts. Yes. Yeah. Moaning harder, harder. Yeah, uh, was you, you? There was no masking what they were trying to do. Yeah, and it could have been done in a such a tasteful way. Yeah, and still had a I don't want to say erotic, but they could have still had it an have intimacy. A, it was this ultimately, an intimacy to yeah. it without without being gratuitous, and it it went into that gratuitous territory with her yelling harder, harder. It yeah. was just I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah. don't know what's it, wrong with that. I felt like it like you're saying there's there's a way to promote the intimacy between characters and intimacy between characters on Star Trek is something that has existed from the beginning of Star Trek. Some yep. of the most heartfelt moments of the original series are Nurse Chapel looking at Spock. And there's there's an element of longing there that is is nicely rendered without it being and then Nurse Chapel took off her top and went to Spock and said, I needed to bring you these samples. I like it. There's the, the <laughs> way that this is played out with, you know, you could have had one, the way it was shot. You never needed the full frontal shot of T'Pol with her hands over her, nope. her breasts. It could have been shot from the back. It could have relied on her giving him instructions saying, you're going to have to press much harder then you might think, and I'll let you know if you're, if you're doing it too hard, but to have it be in the moment of harder, harder while she's got her eyes closed, none of that was necessary. And then if it was also all done while they were talking about anything else, you could have had a moment where the dialogue about another subject yeah. could have revealed that in this moment, there's an intimacy which is not about sexual charge, but about letting down of barriers. Ultimately, it means more to both characters and to us in an audience, as an audience if Trip lets down a barrier that he is desperately holding on to. He has nothing at this point but pain. And for him to let down a barrier and reveal some of that to, to Paul, especially since the series started with him being the most distrustful of her, so in this moment, for him to reveal something he's kept hidden from Reed and from his captain to let her know, yeah. I'm really struggling with this. This is, this is hard for me. Could have been really impactful. Instead, he stands there and says, look, I can't have sex with you. He literally says, yeah, I'm, I'm honored, but I can't have sex with you. He, the writing in this moment is literally taking something that women complain about all the time, which is, any kind of attention given to a man is interpreted as sexual come on. Up to this moment mm-hmm. in this scene, she has not said anything that would reveal any kind of sexual attraction in any way, shape, or form to trip. But the moment she says, now I 
will give you the same massage you just gave me. His response was, well, clearly you're trying to have sex with me. <laughs> and I sat there yeah. just like, come on, can we get past the 13 year old fan fiction and just get into, like I said, if the two of them fully clothed, like, I'm sorry, I could locate your spine without having to see your naked back. Like, fully clothed if she walked him through here's what i could teach you and while they are doing this he is revealing something about his personal pain that he is going through that would have resonated better than what is played up for yep. titillation and worked against the scene it is yeah him in that moment like they're laying they're laying out the idea that Trip is so is shutting down because of his mourning for his sister. He's not going to pick up on sexual overtures. He's not gonna, like that He's would be distracted that would be he would be so distracted by everything that's going on inside his head. He even if somebody did say like, "Hey, do you want to go to the movie night with me and maybe we could share some popcorn and maybe hang out afterward?" He'd be like, "No, I'm not into that. I'm going to go to bed early." Like he's not going to pick up on those cues. For him to read her action and the way he did doesn't actually make sense within the context of the character at that moment. So it was, it was a, like a bad, it was an element that left a bad taste in my mouth. And I just was like, you, you've done so many good things with resetting this season. And I disagree with the, the negative takes on what this, how mm -hmm. this show was interpreted at the time of like Starship Trooper clones and Farscape, you know, knockoffs. They're trying to do something with a series that is literally like this is now four decades of Star Trek. They're trying to reimagine where they can go with this, with this universe. And yeah, maybe it's a little bit referential to other things, but when as much science fiction exists in the world by the year 2003, as does, of course they're going to refer to things that we've seen before. Of course there might be a whiff of Star Wars or a whiff of Farscape. I don't, I don't uh, hold any of that against the series. In fact, I think it's good for them to try and tread a little bit into terrain which seems different from what we've seen before. So they did so many nice things with this episode. Overall, I really felt like, okay, this is a good starting point for the next part of this show. And I, and like you've said previously, we're looking at some exciting episodes and storytelling for season three, but I just, that one element, like I'm fine <laughs> with the two of them having like a romantic storyline between the two of them. I'm fine with that being planted. Yes. I'm fine with yes. their, be, you know, the beginnings of the two of them looking at each other in a different way. That's all perfectly acceptable. We've had romantic relationships in Star Trek from the very beginning. I have no problem with that. It's just make it fit within the parameters of what's going on with the characters in this moment. Now, for the, how much we've been talking about this one scene, you're talking about something that's two minutes of the entire yeah, episode. It so really, it's like, I, I yeah. do want to emphasize for my review of it, where IGN gave it, what was it, one out of five? One out of five, yeah. That seems absurd to me. I'd be giving this like a four out of five. It's yeah. like this was a really good reboot yeah. of the series. Yeah. They're they're laying down really strong threads that you can see coming. Like you don't know what's going to happen, but you can see they're laying down a bunch of threads of stories they can explore over the next over the coming season. It's exciting. Yeah, the show actually feels like it has promise, a newness to it that the first two seasons did not ever have. So it's like for me originally watching this and rewatching it now it's like i'm in yeah it's like this is where the show to me gets good and gets interesting and i'm excited for the next few episodes that we get to talk about yeah they they hint at things like tensions between reed and the military crew which at a certain point in this very episode there is a little bit of the lessening of tensions as reed sees okay there's a purpose for this military crew here but it hints at a kind of abyss like storyline of what is the mm -hmm. what is the relationship here between a crew that has been built around exploration and they're forced into this mission 
of like, oh, you've got to go defend humanity and you're taking along a military component and it raises those questions of, okay, what is Starfleet? What is the overriding mission? Does military interaction taint that or does it need to be incorporated into that? So you have that element added in, in, I think a really nice way. It gives Reed a different place to go with his Mm -hmm. constant refrain of this ship isn't run tightly enough. Now he's looking at a military crew and he's like, well, we don't need to be that tight. And so it puts him in an interesting place. You have them in an isolated location where they are forced to operate in ways that they're not accustomed to. Like they're stripping stuff out of their ship to barter with people. That's, that's a new element. Very Voyager. Yeah, that's very Voyager. We haven't seen that in this series before. And the interaction between the crew and the knowledge of the crew of each other is on display. You don't have the same kind of like, can we trust the Vulcans? Because, well, that's largely been put on hold. They're off by themselves and they all know and trust to Paul. And the thing that stands out the most uh, is everybody had a new haircut. So, you know, yeah. from the moment you start. Like, like, like to Paul's new look. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, to Paul's got a new outfit. Like, yeah, they're off in deep yeah. space. They've never been here before, but. She's got a nice new outfit and her hair looks really nice. To Paul, did you do something with your hair? It looks great. Yeah. Even Archer had a new haircut, <laughs> which made him look like he hadn't yes. showered in about three weeks. But yeah. So that's, I think that overall, I agree with your summary of, you know, give it a four out of five. I think that this, I think it hits a lot of very good notes. It still has those things that I'm just like, okay, can we just let go of that? But overall, like you said, It's three minutes of the overall episode, and on the whole, I thought this show, this episode, did a lot, including it had action that actually made sense, and there were some tense moments, like one of my favorite moments in the episode was them trying to get through the plasma ducts, and they have the debate of, do we keep going up or do we go back because we're about to get fried, and that whole moment seemed very... Uh, well-crafted and made what would have otherwise been a couple of seasons earlier, probably just a couple of guys running up a staircase, turned it into something completely different and a Mm -hmm. real uh, nail biter in that moment. So I think that this episode did a lot of really good stuff. And like Matt just said, I'm looking forward to the next couple of episodes and coming up next, next week we'll be talking about the episode anomaly. Matt, any predictions? What will we be talking about? Things flying around a <laughs> shuttle bay. <laughs> we didn't even mention that. <laughs> which which we didn't talk about, yeah. which, but I like that part. Yeah, I like that part too. So we'll probably be talking about that. It's just another element of the series that at this point, they, they did a nice job of planting some seeds that were not directly referenced in this episode. So we'll be getting into more of that later. Before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you wanted to remind our listeners about? What do you have coming up on your other channel? I would just recommend checking out Still to be Determined, our other podcast, where we kind of follow up on feedback from my undecided videos. And by the time this one's out, Sean and I just talked about heat pumps. Yeah. Got to heat pump all the things. So listen to that. As for me, you can check out my website, seanfarrell.com. You'll find out some information about my books there. Or if you just directly go to your local bookstore or Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you'd like to pick up your books, you can find my work there or your public library. Don't forget, if you'd like to support this show, simply reviewing us on Apple, on Google, or Spotify, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, all of that really does help. Leaving a review, don't forget to subscribe. And if you'd like directly to directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, and there's a Become a Supporter button there that allows you to throw some latinum. We do appreciate it. And if you do that, you become officially part of the crew. You will be a cadet. And when you are a cadet, what does that mean? Well... We have another podcast, the spinoff of this one, which is called Out of Time. What do we talk about on Out of Time? Whatever we feel like. We've been talking about, we've been talking about some strange new worlds. <laughs> we've been talking about some lower decks. We've been talking about some Star Wars and some Disney and some Marvel. So that podcast is available to direct supporters. So when you become a supporter, you become a cadet and you start getting out of time in your feed automatically. So we hope that some of you who might be interested in those kinds of conversations will join us there. All of that really does help support the show. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.